All right, you guys, today we're going to talk about the Coriolis effect. Um, hopefully we can get through this out without me coughing. All right, so what have we done so far when we've looked at weather, our study and variables? First, we looked at our atmosphere. By now, you should know its structure. What are the layers? What's the boundary between that bottom layer and the next layer up? What's it made up of? What gases are the most and the least? Um, heat. You should know that the Earth is heated unevenly. What heats faster? What heats slower? Uh, where is it the hottest? Where is it the coldest? What about altitude? How does that play into heat? Um, and those three methods of heat, energy, conduct, or transfer, convection, conduction, and radiation. How do each of those work? Which ones are most important and least important for the atmosphere? We also talked about air pressure, how it's caused by gravity, affected by depth, what can water do to it, what does temperature do to it, and that it's the cause of wind. And wind always blows from what to what. Okay, you should be able to answer that with high to low. Okay, then we talked about water. We mainly focused on relative humidity. What do we mean when we say relative humidity? Um, and then we also talked about how the amount of water and air is affected by its capacity. So what exactly is capacity and how that capacity is, uh, is controlled by temperature. So what kind of capacity do I have with hot air? What kind of capacity do I have with cold air? The next thing we talked about were air masses. What are they? Well, they're consistent throughout. They don't mix. So obviously tornadoes can't form because hot air mixes with cold air because we found out they don't mix. Um, we know that the boundaries between air masses are called fronts. We know that the warm air masses are less dense and they rise and cool air masses are more dense and they sink. Okay, so that's kind of what we have so far in a nutshell. Not everything, but a lot of the big stuff. Okay, and one of the things we left, um, we left off with when we were first talking about air pressure was this is kind of the way air pressure would work. We'd have high pressure up here, we'd have low pressure at the poles, we should have winds that kind of generally blow towards the equator um, because wind always blows from high to low. But that's an oversimplification, right? We know we have some friction at the surface. We have things like trees and buildings and mountains that kind of slow the wind down. But also rotation makes stuff happen. Um, and by rotation, I mean the rotation of the Earth. That last image was of a non-rotating Earth. So rotation also makes stuff happen. And we're talking over long distances, not from, say, um, you know, uh, uh, West Roads to Village Point, but I'm talking like uh, Grand Island to Omaha. Um, the Earth, when we view it from the North Pole, so if we were to take a spaceship up from the North Pole and look down on the Earth, the Earth would rotate counterclockwise. And so what that makes happen is in our frame of reference, in the Northern Hemisphere, the winds curve to the right. In the Southern Hemisphere, the winds curve to the left. Okay? Um, and so what ends up happening is we get uh, this weird kind of global wind pattern. But what you can see here is up in the north, northern hemisphere, if we stand at the tail of this arrow, it curves to the right. And if we stand at the tail of this arrow and look towards the head, it curves to the right. So all in the northern hemisphere, those all curve to the right. Um, and so this is called a polar cell. Um, you don't have to know what the names of these cells are, but in essence what happens is this high pressure area at the pole as it sinks down and travels along the earth tends to heat up and so it starts to rise again and you get this little loop here. And then here at the equator this hot stuff's rising, it cools down as it travels along the, tropo, uh, the tropopause and it sinks back down here and then it warms up again as it goes across the surface of the earth. And then where we live here in our latitudes, we're kind of this one caught in the middle of all that. So we have the hot stuff rising right here and the cold stuff sinking here, which actually kind of drags our air along with it. And so we end up having uh, weather that comes, or a, a prevailing wind that comes from the south towards the north, and it still curves to the right. And this is caused by something called the Coriolis effect. To an observer above the merry-go-round, the path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. Okay, so I'm going to mute this, and we're going to back it up a bit. 
And the one that's on Blackboard is better. It's not quite so grainy. But what I want you to notice is, okay, Kid in the Yellow's got it, right? Okay, so now he's on this side of the screen. He's going to roll the ball across the, across the merry-go-round, and you'll see the ball go straight across. So we would think that the kid in the green is going to catch it, right? But, wait a second. The ball started here on the left-hand side of the screen, and it ended up on the right. But the kid in red caught it. So to them, sitting on the merry-go-round, it appeared to curve. But to us, above the merry-go-round, we saw it go all the way across the screen. Let's try this again, make sure that's really how it works. So now the kid in red's got it. Oops, I missed. Sorry. Okay, so there's the kid in yellow from the left to the right, from the bottom. Okay, so now from the bottom, this kid up here in the blue thinks, okay, it's so mine. Watch. Watch him reach. Ugh! But instead, it still lands at the top. This poor guy is still reaching for the ball, but it lands at the top of the screen. So that ball curves to the people on the merry-go-round. But for those of us above the merry-go-round, it goes straight. Now notice this merry-go-round is spinning clockwise. Um, when you see that above you, it's going clockwise. This was made for the southern hemisphere, because in reality, um, for us in the northern hemisphere, um, it would the merry-go-round would be spinning the other direction. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here. This wind is truly going just straight north. This wind is truly going just straight south. But that Coriolis effect is causing those to appear to curve. So this is what we would see here on the surface of the Earth. And again, to notice that Coriolis effect, we stand at the tail of each arrow. And, fa and if we imagine standing here and facing towards the head of the arrow, it would curve to the right. At the southern hemisphere, that actually makes it go to the left. We're never going to ask you about the Southern Hemisphere because we don't live there. <coughs> all right, so when we take this Coriolis effect and we add in all of these pieces, what we end up with is this um, system of weather called a cyclone. Now, a cyclone is not a tornado. That's why that big picture is down there. Okay, it's not a tornado. These are large-scale weather systems, and it's how we can fit all these variables together. And it's the answer to that question we asked a couple weeks ago. Why do we get sunny weather with high pressure, and why do we get rainy and cloudy weather with low pressure? So some definitions. A cyclone is caused by hot air rising. Let's say that again. A cyclone is caused by hot air rising. It represents an area of low pressure at the surface. They have counterclockwise winds, and air is moving inward at the surface. We call that convergence. Okay? Um, Anticyclones are the opposite. These are caused by cold air sinking. They're areas of high pressure at the surface, and they have clockwise winds. They also have air moving outward at the surface, or divergence. Now, things to keep in mind is, notice how they're exactly the opposite. So if you only have to memorize one, you can keep in mind that the other one's exactly the opposite. But also, I don't have to memorize a whole lot. If I can remember that hot air rises and wind always blows from high pressure to low pressure, I can figure the rest out. Okay. So in your notes, you have this diagram with this H and this L. And so if we remember, wind blows from high to low. The other thing to remember is that's not just happening in one direction. It's going out in all directions. Okay, So um, that's going to happen in all directions outward from the high and all directions inward from the low, towards the low. And this is a surface, or excuse me, a, an aerial view. So if I were to take a helicopter up or in the International Space Station and look down, this is kind of what we would see. These circles represent your isobars, but you can kind of draw this in on your diagram. But we have to think about that Coriolis effect, right? So the Coriolis effect says those arrows don't go straight in. They actually curve to the right. So I just overlaid some pink arrows there to show you how those would curve to the right. And you actually can see these on weather maps. The only difference is there's front lines because air masses don't mix. And this is caused by this hot air mass rising, okay? So what this actually looks like are, now I took away the straight arrows, left the curved arrows in, and I added these front lines. And they're kind of bowed like that because they, um, because that's kind of how they will travel. Um, and so they move faster here, and it's a little bit harder for the middle to get going, and it's really hard for this tail end to get going. So, <clears throat> excuse me, low pressure is caused by warm air rising. So this warm air mass right here is the cause of this low pressure system. And 
A warm front's sort of like a Sunday driver. It kind of moseys along. It slides up over this cold air pretty slowly. You end up with this long, slow-lasting rain. And um, because it cools so slowly, it takes its time. So it doesn't really have a whole lot going on. The cold fronts here, though, are more like road rage drivers. They shove underneath the air mass in front of them. And so they lift this air very quickly. So here where we have a big temperature change, what we're going to see are more like severe weather. Um, so you might ha you're for sure going to have rain, but it might be a more of a downpour type. Or you might have a thunderstorm, something like that. And these fronts, again, are curved due to that friction force uh, in interaction with the air mass and the surface. Um, if you've ever played line tag, I think is what my kids called it. We always called it crack the whip, um, where you do tag and you hold hands if you get caught. And it's that kid that's on the very end that has to run the fastest. And this kid's trying to, and these, this kid here is dragging everybody along. That's kind of the way fronts work, too. So, wait a minute. So if high pressure is caused by cold air sinking, why do we get warm, nice days with a high pressure system? And if low pressure goes with warm air, why do we get cold, rainy days? So obviously there's something vertically happening here too as well. So if hot stuff's rising, we get low pressure here. And if cold air sinking, we get high pressure here. What else is happening? The high pressure system here has cold air sinking. And what we also have to think about is what happens to the temperature of that cold air as it sinks. It's going to warm up. We're getting closer to this bottom heat source. We're also compressing it. So this also, this warming, increases its capacity. If I take the water that was in this air pack parcel and I pour it into a bigger cup, it's going to decrease its relative humidity, and therefore it's going to be sunny. Likewise, over here, hot air rises. As it rises, it cools because it expands and it's getting farther away from this bottom heat source. That decreases its capacity, which increases its relative humidity. And if you get it increased enough, you get a cloud. Okay, So the vertical movement is really important. But as this wind blows from this high pressure system to this low pressure system on the other side, what you end up with is this cold air moving into this warm air area. There's your cold front right there. That cold front was caused by this cold air over here at this high pressure area moving into this low pressure area. And so there's a significant temperature difference. There's your cold front. Okay, So we go back to that definition. Those cyclones are caused by that hot air rising. And they represent that area of low pressure at the surface. They have counterclockwise winds because that Coriolis effect turns them right. And they have air moving inward at the surface, which causes that convergence. So I don't, didn't really have to know any of that to be able to explain because I remembered that air moves from high pressure to low pressure. And it's caused by hot air rising. Okay. Now, here's the thing. We also had that convergence word and that divergence word. We have to remember that convergence always means moves toward and divergence always means moves away. So convergence can be thought of like converging plates or converging air or convergent ideas. A convergent idea if you're all sitting around with your friends and you're like, what do you want to do? Well, let's watch a movie. Well, what movie do we want to watch? And about four people say the same movie, that's convergent thinking. Different people came up with the same idea. Divergence, on the other hand, means to move away. So you can have, again, you can have divergent plate boundaries. You could have divergent air or you could have divergent ideas. A divergent idea might be something like a computer chip. If I make a computer chip that's super tiny and super fast, what could I do with it? Well, I could put it in my smartphone, or I could put it in my calculator, or I could put it in a tablet, or I could put it in a computer. Um, those are divergent ways to use the same idea. And so divergence means move away, convergence means move towards. So the problem with convergence in a low pressure system is when I bring that air in, because air moves from high pressure to low pressure, it's actually going to increase the low, increase the pressure and weaken the low. It's going to make more molecules be there. Well, that low won't stay low very long. So what has to happen then is you have to get rid of those molecules some way. So what happens is above at the tropopause, Divergence has to happen in order to maintain the low. 
So what would happen is that air would rise, it would hit that roof of that triple pause and move out and away. Same thing here, as this hot air is getting pushed out, it starts to cool and it comes in over here and starts to sink. So this is also happening in three dimensions. So all this air that's coming into this point is an area of convergence and it sinks down and hits the ground and spreads out. That's an area of divergence. So for each kind of pressure system, you're always going to have um, you're always going to have this convergence and divergence. On your essay, when you take your essay test, you will need to mention both what's happening at, above the surface and what's happening at the surface. So you need to mention both. So what, should, what have you learned already? We started with uneven heating. How uneven heating of, of land and water don't heat the same, or altitude for that matter. We talked about temperature. What's significant about that temperature? Well, that relates to air's density, and air's density gives us air pressure and our vertical movement. The air pressure gives us wind, and the wind is turned by the Coriolis effect due to that global rotation. The vertical movement then causes changes in temperature, which causes changes in relative humidity because of capacity. It also then will all work together for, to put together a cyclone, which has convergence and divergence. All right, hope you guys are ready for your uh, essay, and good luck.